Hello and welcome back to another episode of Colour With Me, where I talk about decolonial theory, curatorial practice and contemporary art galleries while colouring away. In this video, I'll be exploring the concept of chromophobia in relation to white cube gallery aesthetics and Eurocentrism in visual art. In the background, I'll be colouring an image inspired by the Wizard of Oz. If you want to find out why this is relevant to the topic of this episode, then please watch this video to the very end. I'll be using the Uhuhu brush marker set and as always you can find out more information about these materials in the description box of this video. With all that said, let's get colouring. The word chromophobia means the irrational fear of being contaminated by colour. In the year 2000, the artist and writer David Batchelor published a groundbreaking book called Chromophobia, where he explored the ways in which colour has been used in Western culture to represent a form of corruption and how chromophobia has contributed to the purging of colour within various forms of visual arts. Batchelor suggests that this purge is accomplished in one of two ways. He states that, in the first, colour is made out to be the property of some foreign body, usually the feminine, the oriental, the primitive, the infantile, the vulgar, the queer or the pathological. In the second, colour is regulated to the realm of the superficial, the supplementary, the inessential or the cosmetic. The book also outlines the ways in which prominent Western artists, philosophers, anthropologists and writers have developed work in their fields that have assisted in keeping this prejudice alive. One of the people who Bachelor discusses is the French architect Le Corbusier, who developed the Law of Rippling. The Law of Rippling ultimately demanded that rooms and buildings be completely painted with white paint, specifically Rippolin, which was a popular brand of paint at that time. In his book, The Decorative Art of Today, which was published in 1925, he wrote, Imagine the results of the law of Rippolin. Every citizen is required to replace his hangings, his the masks, his wallpapers, his stencils, with a plain coat of white Rippolin, his home made clean. There are no more dirty dark corners. Everything is shown as it is. Then in the cleanness for the course adopted leads to a refusal to allow anything at all which is not correct, authorised, intended, desired, thought out. As well as emphasising the notion that whiteness symbolises health, supremacy and truth, Le Corbusier also suggested that the whitewashing of buildings should be implemented through the authorities stating that whitewash is extremely moral. Suppose there was a decree requiring all rooms in Paris to be given a coat of whitewash. I obtained that that would be a police task of real stature, a manifestation of high morality, a sign of a great people. In some circles, Le Corbusier is celebrated because of his influence as an urban planner and the impact of the law of Rippolin on modern architecture. However, what is sometimes overlooked is the fact that he was also involved in fascist circles and wrote numerous articles about urbanism for fascist journals. There have been academics such as Mark Wigley who have highlighted the links between Le Corbusier's obsession with whitewashing and his totalitarian and eugenicist morals. In his article titled Chronic Whiteness, Wigley states that Le Corbusier didn't simply call for whitewash to be imposed by the police in the name of health. It was meant to act as a form of policing in its own right, a technology of surveillance that would put in motion an ever-expanded culture of self-policing. Whitewash exposes every dimension of life in front of it to judgement. It acts like a court of assize and permanent session that will give a power of judgement to the individual and thereby make each one of us a perdant judge. Whiteness is both the effect and means of cleaning buildings, bodies, eyes, brains and society to produce pure, clean, clear, bare, neat, sharp, simple, exact, essential, economical, healthy people, forms and thoughts. 
Over time, there have been other academics who have analysed the connections between the policing of colour, aesthetics of coloniality, and attitudes towards people of colour, such as Professor William A. Carvel Curios, who published an article titled The Politics of Colour, Resignifications, Chromophobia, Chromogenics, and the Epistemologies of Taste in 2013. In this article, he makes some interesting points about how Europe's relationship to colour is a complex one which involves rejecting colour but also desiring it and thus finding a way to conquer it and control it. He writes that the rejection of bright colours in Europe creates an internal conflict, a tension, a crisis between what is morally acceptable and the exotic other. The irresistibility of colour sets in motion a process of both rejecting and desiring the other. The policing of colour launched a European colour conquest, a safari for colour that required non-Westerners to be simultaneously rejected and idealised and exoticised. He then goes on to explain how Western artists such as Paul Gugan, Pablo Picasso, Paul Cezanne and Vincent van Gogh appropriated and repackaged art from tribal cultures as modern Western art movements, writing that this possessing slash conquering the aesthetic other represents a form of colonial violence. The chromatic appropriations without acknowledging their origins represents another form of European imperialism, one that is based on aesthetic extraction, commoditization, and exploitation. This is what is behind Van Gogh's desire, as he said, to master the savage combination of incongruous tones of non-Europeans, as well as in the development of the international style. This rejection, idealization, and exoticization of color in regards to visual arts and race is something which I believe underpins the ways in which work by artists of color is curated in white cube galleries with white dominated exhibition programs. On occasions where they do deviate from their usual programming to satisfy the inevitable desire for color and cultural diversity, what we sometimes see is the tokenistic treatment of artists of color and the misrepresentation of work to appease white Western audiences. In addition, these token exhibitions are often temporary displays that offer a peek into alternative reality before being taken down. These temporary token exhibitions are something that I thought about while reading about the introduction of colour film in Hollywood in the Chromophobia book. Bachelor talks about the status of colour film when it was first introduced to cinema. He wrote that colour film was deemed suitable mainly for fantasies, musicals and period pieces. Drama remained largely a monochrome issue. Birchall also goes on to talk about films that start off in black and white and transform into colour, and how this is used to signify a fall from grace and exploration of or transition into a psychotic episode. The films he lists include Wings of Desire, A Matter of Life and Death, and Wizard of Oz. It was while reading the section on Wizard of Oz that I began to think about how contemporary galleries are a bit like Kansas and Oz is a bit like these alternative contemporary exhibitions. In the film, Dorothy, who's the main character, travels from Kansas to Oz, a technicolor fantastic world via a tornado. Not only is Oz a complete contrast to sepia Kansas, but it is also filled with challenging characters, creatures and adventures. Although even after all these amazing life-changing experiences and deep personal growth, in the end, Dorothy is still convinced that she must go back to her colour purge life, stating there's no place like home. Like Oz, these token exhibitions create these sort of short-lived alternative realms before they are taken down and replaced with constructed normality. Like Chromophobia, The Law of Rippling, and Kansas, the white cube gallery format is rationalised by the reinforcement of the idea that colour must be controlled. Although the way the white cube gallery format is rationalised suggests that the method is necessary to allow artwork to be observed 
in the best way. One can argue that it has become a method of policing what is and what isn't art. This is why I believe that the notion of the white cube aesthetic format creates a universal space is a scam that reinforces Eurocentric art and cultural ideologies. Therefore, I think that the process of decolonizing contemporary art galleries must involve recognizing how this obsession with white walls is linked to a desire to maintain a high order and authority, as well as rejecting the idea that contemporary art must be shown in colorless, undecorated temples and framed by whiteness in order to be legitimate. Well, that's it for this episode of Colour With Me. I hope that you found this episode interesting. And if you enjoy videos like these, please don't forget to like, comment and share. And if you want to make sure that you don't miss out on any uploads, please don't forget to hit that notification bell. Thank you for watching. Take care and see you soon.